If you're looking for a car that's fun, functional, and offers comfort, all in one cool and fun package, the 2023 Kia Soul is your answer. The all-new Kia Soul. Visit kia.com or a local dealer near you. This podcast is supported by Foothill Transit, greening big with North America's largest fleet of new hydrogen fuel cell buses. You can learn more about this clean and quiet bus fleet at foothilltransit.org slash greening big. LAS Studios. Hi, it's Vivian here. Recently, the K pop dreaming team held a live event in front of an audience to go deeper into some of the topics that the podcast series touched on. The panelists who joined me for this wide ranging conversation were Michelle Cho, a professor of East Asian popular cultures and cinema studies at the University of Toronto, and Janelle Brown a faculty member at the California Institute of the Arts and Otis College of Art and Design. Here's an edited excerpt of the conversation. Oh, and just a note, we refer to a number of video clips during the conversation. Links to those videos have been included in the show notes so you can watch them too. Enjoy. Hello! Thank you so much for being here. I'm Vivian Yoon. I'm the writer and host of Elias Studios podcast, K-Pop Dreaming. Um, the podcast... <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> um, so the podcast dives into some of the history and the origins behind the music. And we're going to talk about some of that history today, you know, specifically with regards to the role of U.S. imperialism in K-pop and the role of hip-hop in K-pop. Um, we're also going to talk about really fun things like diaspora. Um, so in the third episode of our podcast, which is called Trot, we take a look at Japanese colonialism, which started in 1910 in Korea. And we see how Korean music evolved through the Japanese presence there. And we kind of touch on how, like, throughout the 20s and 30s, American music influences came into Korea. Um, things like swing and jazz and the foxtrot and things like that. But then really it was after World War II when the U.S. military stationed itself in what was about to become South Korea that we really got a much more, like, dramatic increase in American music and culture. And this is actually something you told us about, Michelle, in the very, very early stages of planning for the podcast, the impact impact that USO shows had on Korean music back then. Um, I actually want us to play a video of a group called the Korean Kittens, who were a Korean group um, performing at a USO show in Southeast Asia for American soldiers. Wow. Very surprising. I was so surprised when I first saw that clip because I just couldn't believe that that kind of voice was coming out from like, you know, this Korean woman singer. But tell us more about like USO shows and how they impacted Korean music. Sure. Um, well, I don't know. You all may be aware of the fact that the American military has been present on the Korean Peninsula since really at the end of World War II and then um, during and after the Korean War, which is not technically over. And that is why the military kind of stays and is still stationed there. Um, and so since there are large populations of U.S. soldiers, there are musical artists, entertainers who come through who are there to entertain, um, often to kind of give uh, soldiers a bit of the sound of home. And so there were a lot of Korean musicians who actually got jobs entertaining soldiers or jobs near bases, and they learned American musical styles in order to cater to their GI audiences. But that's yeah. really how Korean musicians start to play this kind of music and run with it and Korean ears follow. 
I mean, it's so fascinating because that song they cover is What I Say by Ray Charles. And the sound is so specific, right? And they really like match it perfectly. I, I was kind of stunned and I honestly still like don't really know how to fit it into my brain sometimes of like, how am I supposed to feel about this? But it is really interesting because in the conversation about, you know, the role of black American music and culture, there are so many layers like this, right? Where it really was a direct result of US imperialism. Um, that I think is really fascinating. The other thing that you mentioned, um, Michelle, that I thought was fascinating was like the economic impact that the USO shows had in South Korea too, which I wasn't aware of. Yeah, beyond just the the shows, the economies that popped up that that were really there to support the military presence. So whether that's venues or clubs and and places that GIs would be able to go when they were, you know on break, um, or supply chains, just because after the Korean War ended, the domestic economy was quite um, weak. I mean, there there was a period of time in which the country kind of had to rebuild itself. And so the a lot of economic activity was actually spurred by and, and really fueled by the US presence. Yeah. So it kind of makes sense that these artists they um, were drawn to this music and wanted to learn how to perform it, but they also did it because they needed jobs. They yeah. needed work. There was an economic yeah, incentive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, even groups now, like K-pop artists, you know, from the second generation, third and fourth, they are still nodding to the importance of USO shows, Right. So I think we have two clips that we're going to play. One is from Girls' Generation music video Genie. Okay, so that video is what, like over 10 years old now. Um, I saw it a lot when I was like in college. I never knew that they were referencing like USO shows. I thought they just wanted to look like cute sailors in like really short shorts. <laughs> so that was like really intentional. Yeah, I think that what they are referencing is this idea of like a performance culture. Like, you know, being able to perform in those spaces was a way to reach audiences that were outside of just your locality, right? And then there's a certain kind of like excitement of almost like a celebrity culture, right? I think that K-pop groups might be referencing that sort of spectacle. Yeah. Were you a fan of Girls' Generation? Not particularly. I mean, well, really, <laughs> no, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah. no shade. Yeah, come on, y'all, no shade. But it's really <laughs> just that like when my fandom started, it kind of was like, third generation active okay. so it's really just I think a question of time I don't have answers but like what what is being signaled and what is being signaled in terms of the kind of like normalization of American militarism and imperialism and so like it's just I think a, a question for me of how to kind of like mediate and mitigate maybe the effects of of those images um in terms of just also furthering the kind of American imperial project, which as Michelle just said, is still present and still very yeah. much kind of orders a geo or like a geopolitical order, I guess. You know? That's really fascinating yeah. too, because I feel like the impression I have always gotten from K-pop, just, just as somebody who grew up with it, not as like a scholar or somebody who analyzes it, analyzes it for real, but I always got the sense that a lot of... Um, images and concepts and symbols are not given the same weight as maybe some of the, the ways that like artists here in the States might, because in the US, I feel like we have developed um, a language for analysis for media and culture in a way that might not be as advanced in South Korea or as like popular in mainstream discussions maybe. I don't know, I'm just guessing. I just see you smiling. I'm like, am I? Is what I'm saying completely wrong? There's a lot of analysis there of K-pop. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. of K-pop, yeah. yeah. But in terms of like the intentionality behind using some of these images, um, like, are they aware of how loaded or significant they might be? K-pop groups still perform for Korean soldiers, like 
the military is such a core part of um, you know people's lived experience because every male citizen has to serve for 18 to 22 months it right. used to be 22 months now it's 18 and so k-pop groups still perform in shows for korean soldiers and for american soldiers you know there's a joint um all right forces um there's a security alliance uh in in the region so that kind of culture in the space that contact zone it's not just in the you know, 60s. It's not just in the mid-century. It's it continues today. It's still super prevalent yeah, today. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, the what you saw in the Girls' Generation video to relate it back to the Korean kitchens, right? We see um, single gender groups, young performers forming on stage. Um, there's definitely a nod to that, like the the idol group that of that we know of today. It has an origin in the performance groups. Um, the Korean kittens were citing Motown, right? You know, so there's also this kind of direct lineage of it's all connected. Yes, <laughs> yeah, American groups and um, Korean pop groups as well. We have another example of this too: um, a dance performance video by BTS. <laughs> Okay, now that you said all everything you said, I see that video very differently because I'm like, of course, like they are still performing for troops. That video is kind of interesting because those of you who are BTS fans, you know that the fandom is ARMY and there's this kind of like military metaphor in the bulletproof Boy Scouts, you know, Pang Tan Son Yan Dan. Um, there's a reference to this military culture. And again, military culture is part of everyday life for most Koreans, um, if you yourself are not a man who has to go serve, you have family members and, you know. Yeah. Um, but there's a great point that Janelle brought up of the normalization of military culture, um, what that means and what that might do to a society. I think that there are a lot of people who wish that BTS didn't have to go away for a while to serve this in this way. But unfortunately, the political situation is still one of, of conflict, so they have to. Um, but I think that when K-pop groups now remind us of this history, they're also maybe allowing us to like, think it through in critical ways. Coming up, we unpack the complicated feelings around Korean rap, hip-hop, and an essay that Janelle wrote about her relationship to the music. That's coming up after the break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. We are always growing and learning, and that's why getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, and it can be really rewarding. I personally have definitely benefited from therapy. I'm already a pretty self-reflective person, but speaking with a therapist gave me the tools and language to take that self-reflection to the next level. And it helped me become a less anxious, more relaxed version of myself, which I love. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and it's designed to fit your schedule, no matter how busy it is. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com dreaming today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash dreaming. This podcast is supported by Foothill Transit, who is greening big with the largest fleet of new hydrogen fuel cell buses in North America. You can be among the first to experience the power of hydrogen with its quieter and cleaner ride. More information about Foothill Transit's commitment to sustainability and their move toward a zero emissions bus fleet at foothilltransit.org slash greening big. And and so to take it back back again in time to like the 80s and 90s now, you know, in the podcast, we have an episode called Moon Night. And it really looks at this one nightclub in Itaewon, this neighborhood in South Korea, 
um, that was right next to the U.S. military headquarters at the time. And this Club Moon Night, it was a spot for American GIs, but not just any American GIs, but specifically black American GIs to listen to hip hop, R&B. And it turned out that a ton of early K-pop legends hung out there. Um, so I just want to play a clip of this Hoteji and Boys music video, Hayaga, because they actually filmed this video inside Moon Night, the club, so we get to see what it looks like. Okay, okay, what do we think? With where we kind of walked into this clip, you know, the fact of the matter is the clubs were segregated. And so for me, it's so fascinating to think of then how the kind of racial politics of the West were being reproduced in this space in which black culture becomes a kind of focal point, a central point an aspirational point that we might unpack later, later, later in the conversation. But then, of course, black people are at the bottom of a kind of racial political order. So then how is that reproduced? But then how is that tension? How, like, how, what's, how are those things bumping up against each other when like black music, black cultural production becomes something that people aspire to or want to emulate, and particularly Koreans in this context? Yeah, I think it's really interesting to... Um, think about Korea's importance as a space where U.S. race relations are playing out and then being reproduced. Um, so the Korean War was actually the first um, conflict that the U.S. participated in as you know the kind of leader of the U.N. forces um, with desegregated units. And so um, it was a space where Americans fighting shoulder to shoulder were having to also work out the ways that they were going to respond to this kind of change. The social changes that were happening in the U.S. concerning race relations, there was a lot of resistance to that move and also many ways that the racial hierarchy was maintained despite these changes that were occurring. And so having segregated spaces of leisure for GIs is one way that certain kind of racial regime is being maintained. Yeah, and this is something I mentioned in the podcast too that as I was learning about Moon Knight and Itaewon in the 80s, I discovered that my dad was stationed there um, with the U.S. Army. So he was a Korean-American soldier serving with the U.S. Army stationed in Korea. And he identified more with the American soldiers than the Korean locals who lived there. Um, and when I asked him, is it true that the neighborhood was self-segregated? He said, yeah. And actually, so Itaewon, you know, the neighborhood, it looks like this big hill and there's one main road that separates the establishments on the left and the right. And he said uh, it was self-segregated among the soldiers. And it just so happened that the establishments for, you know, white soldiers were to the left of the main street and establishments for black soldiers were to the right. And my dad hung out on the left side of the street. And he said that soldiers, you know, on both sides referred to that main road as the DMZ or the dark man zone. These were all things that were instigated and kind of like upheld in a de facto way within the U.S. Army. So they were bringing their own, that's what you're saying, their own um, racial dynamics over to South Korea which end up permeating South Korean ways of thinking about race. Um, and then I also want to talk too about how, you know, we think of South Korea as having been subjected to occupation, right? Both by Japan and the U.S., but the narrative is actually more complicated than that. Um, this is not a well-known fact, but second to American soldiers South Korean soldiers were the force that um, fought in the Vietnam War at the highest level. So, on behalf of the American mm -hmm. side, yes. Right. So, um, South Korea's post war kind of recovery was actually 
pretty strongly um, bolstered by the Vietnam War because it was a way that uh, the nation could receive funding, money, you know, soldiers who were fighting on the side of the Americans were bringing versus supplies to, to South Korea. There's a way that South Korea can both be simultaneously a formally colonized space and also engage in some of the same kinds of colonial or neo-colonial relations with its less developed neighbors, where it's going into these places, extracting resources and enacting violence yeah yeah, yeah. and migrant trying to labor, establish yeah. hegemony too yeah we and have also a, think about migrant laborers from, from laborers from southeast asia and how that kind of power dynamic in, in the country as well i think south korean popular culture's kind of dominance in that region is due to the fact that you know south korea's modernization story is seen as aspirational And so, you know, countries in the region, they want to become the next Korean wave. Um, But it also can cover over those more violent histories. And so, yeah, again, we're here to to bring those to light and to make the consumption of the Korean wave more thoughtful, perhaps. And then the thing that, like, complicates all of these things even further is when you add like the Korean diaspora into the mix. In the podcast, we have an episode where we kind of look at one of these groups called Solid, and they were the first Korean American group to make it big in South Korea. Um, And they really brought over like the genre of R&B. But I really want to talk about this concept of diaspora because when people talk about groups like Solid, they often refer to like these Korean American musical artists as like returning home to South Korea when that might not be their home because they were born and raised in the States, right? So maybe we can just kind of take a second to unpack like what the idea of home is when we talk about diaspora. Diaspora is a term that refers to a group of people who are leaving a point of origin and moving elsewhere, settling elsewhere. There's a Korean Japanese diaspora. There's a Korean Chinese diaspora. There's a Korean Mexican diaspora. There's a Soviet Korean diaspora, right? It really pushes you to have to learn the histories. Like why? Why did people leave? Yeah, the patterns of immigration and the impetuses. Like why? Right, because it all ties into geopolitics good old geopolitics um you know this event is put together in partnership with LAist and Kyopo and Kyopo is the word that designates like Koreans who live abroad or grew up abroad right who are not considered the same as local Koreans or native Koreans who have lived in the country their entire lives and people have all kinds of different relationships with that word because it can be alienating but for me personally I totally identify as a Kyopo because I'm like, yes, I am American um, in ways that like South Koreans are definitely not. The first time I went back was in 2020, right before the pandemic hit. And I was miserable. Like I really was. And I hadn't been back to Korea in like, I would say 12 or 13 years since I was a kid and the country had changed so much, right? Like all these new buildings, everything's high tech, everything's more efficient there. Um, And all that stuff was great. But in terms of fitting in with the actual members of the society, I was instantly seen as a foreigner. People would avoid me. They wouldn't talk to me. And when I spoke in Korean, they would always have this funny look on their face because even though my pronunciation is like pretty good, um, Just, you know, the diction and certain things just give away the fact that I'm something is off and they can't tell if I'm just like a little slow or what or something. But you can see people taking their time dealing with me. And it got so frustrating because I felt like I couldn't communicate and I couldn't reveal my own personality because of the language barrier. Like there were so many issues that came up during that trip to the point where halfway through I just started speaking in English to everybody and signaling before as a defense right like signaling to them that I am not one of you before you can make me feel like I'm not one of you so it it is very complicated and going back and I wonder like if there is a concept um in Jamaica that is similar to Kyopo or like people who live abroad yeah of course I mean I think everywhere you know what I mean and I think that's kind of 
uh, a universal trait of being first generation somewhere or first generation in the West, I have from my parents being from a nominally black nation, right? Um, and like the circumstances under which my parents came to this country and being very clear about the space that I take up in spaces that are meant for African Americans and not for me, right? And so like, that's hard because I'm still a black person in America and all that comes along with it, right? And so, because I do think that shows up in tension, like let's say between black folks and Koreans in yeah. LA, right? And yeah. so I would, I would ask, like if I was talking to a friend, I would ask them to be cognizant, like a friend who is Korean American, I would ask them to be cognizant of like what's gonna happen in a liquor store. You know what I mean? What's gonna happen when I go to Ebony Wigs on Crenshaw, which mm -hmm. is owned by Korean folks, right? Um, so I think it, it, it uh, so much of this conversation for me is like, thinking about power and also just having conversations that are a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, the thing that really sticks out to me is how individual the mm. sense of identity and diaspora and every person has a different relationship to the communities they come from and the communities they don't belong to as mm. well. That's different mm. too. I think it's so interesting looking at Tiger JK, the famous Korean rapper who is now known as like the godfather of rap in South Korea. He actually moved to the US from South Korea when he was 11 or 12 years old. He lived in Florida first and then he came to LA during like high school and he was in LA during the uprising and he actually like ended up performing at this hip hop festival that was meant to like try and repair race relations or promote ethnic harmony, um, things like that. But I want to talk about Tiger JK's wife, who is another famous South Korean rapper named Yoon Mire, and she goes by Tasha. Tasha was born to a Korean mother and a black American father who was a US soldier. And she was born in Texas, but she moved to South Korea as a child. And, you know, both Tiger JK and Tasha have like commented on and spoke out against racism towards black people in South Korea. So we have a clip of Yoon Mire's song, Black Happiness. And we're just going to play the first verse and the chorus with the subtitles so you can see, you know, what she's really singing about. That's heartbreaking. This track was really important because it was the first direct kind of address to the Korean public to explain and, and kind of confront people with this experience. Um, and so Yoon Mire, uh, Tasha Reed, uh, she, yeah, she has such an importance as a musical artist who was able to do that. And so, yeah, I'm really glad that we were able to share that with you. I want to talk about Janelle's essay because I feel like it touches on so many of these ideas. Um, you wrote an essay called Too Much Emotional Trauma with My K-Pop. And it really... That's what it is, <laughs> y'all. I mean, I gotta be honest. Like... Yeah, it's it's such a good read. Like, I highly recommend everybody go home, Google it. Um, it's great because you really tackle this idea head on of like explaining your conflicting feelings about hip hop and rap in South Korean music. You really point to some specific and very like provocative examples you know and i'd love for you to tell us more it's funny because that was like early on like if i end up so even reading it now there's like more layers more layers <laughs> and even some stuff honestly like that essay uh I, uh 
there's there's a lot of uh, okay. This is it's really complicated. Um, but like. I would prefer if a lot of people didn't really you know, oh okay no, no, no. y'all are here so it, it is what it is and people but like there's some kind of like um because there is emotional trauma we'll see some pictures of things that i think are like very just like triggering her black but not like violent like we not we don't do spectacle of black death in these parts but i just mean like some other things that we're gonna see and it's like but don't get it twisted. Like, I'm a stan. You know what I mean? Like, Michelle and I were in Vegas for permission to dance. Like, you know what I mean? Like, don't, don't y'all don't get it twisted. We're going yeah. to August D. All of that stuff is happening. <laughs> don't get it twisted, y'all. But that happens alongside all of the kind of, like, stuff we just talked right. about. For me, that was written, I think, a year or two after I got into K-pop. And at that time, I was, like, really into, I think it was Big Bang at the time. And YG groups. And YG groups are known very, for a very particular orientation toward, towards hip-hop. But um, in the essay, I just talk about that, the kind of work of compartmentalizing that, all of that emotionally, which is, like, feels like work and can be very confusing. But I perform a very specific dance of like how I talk about this. So with that essay, like I don't talk about it with a lot of black people because I'm ashamed of the things I'm working out. You get what I'm saying? Um, and like this event, I, I talk to people about it, but like I didn't post it on my social media, right? Because it's very conflicting for me. Um, so in the essay, I talk about some of those things, and I don't know if we want to go to, I f think the, f I forget. Jay Park's the, DNA. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. That's the one we're going into? Yeah. <laughs> we, we talked about this, but we should go into that. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 We're going to see a music video from an artist named Jay Park, and it's called DNA. <laughs> Even that is a, like not the most egregious. And like if you watch the whole video, the, the initial video was taken down because Jay Park got a lot of flack. And then I think he like reshot a different version. Um, DNA being a, a, it is a remix or like an interpolation of Kendrick Lamar's DNA. And um, he's a Korean American rapper who has gotten in a lot of yeah. trouble and faced a lot of criticism for cultural appropriation, like specifically. Um, and so that goes back to this, what I was saying about diaspora and about kind of like, you know, Jay Park is someone performing black music, hip hop and R&B is black music, right? Um, what it, What is the kind of accountability or responsibility one has to like navigate things that can be called appropriation or anti-blackness or all these things? Right. Coming up, we continue looking into these nuanced dynamics of race and power in K-pop with questions from our audience. That's coming up after the break. Life can get busy. You need a car that's comfortable, practical, and extra points if it looks cool, too. That is where the 2023 Kia Soul comes in. It's a ride that packs fun, functionality, and comfort all in one. The 2023 Kia Soul provides plenty of passenger and cargo space, too. So whether you're doing your weekend shopping or going on a road trip with friends, there's always plenty of room. And the 2023 Kia Soul has the intuitive tech you need. Count on the available 10.25-inch touchscreen display with navigation to take you where you need to go. Or connect your compatible phone to the car to listen to your favorite jams and your favorite podcast. The all-new 2023 Kia Soul. Learn more at kia.com. Not all features available on all trims. Some features may vary. Distracted driving can result in a loss of vehicle control. When operating a vehicle, never use a vehicle system that takes your focus away from safe vehicle operation. Navigation is for information purposes only, and Kia does not make any warranties about the accuracy of the information. I really want to open it up to audience questions. If anybody has a question, um, feel free to raise your hand, and there are people who will be coming by with mics. Hi, um, I'm sort of kind of an avid BTS fan as well. And anyone who's sort of kind of familiar with like the early stages of the band, 
can very much speak to some very weird, like just weird racist kind of vibes. And I sort of kind of wonder, like as a K-pop stan, like how sort of kind of do you sort of kind of defend sort of kind of, I guess, like your stan or your idol and like, do you even feel the need to defend them? The rappers in BTS, like I think they're phenomenal rappers, right? Um, and there are times where I'm like maybe talking to a friend or something. I want them to be like recognized as really good rappers. And what I'm saying is I want them to be recognized as being really good at performing an art form, which is black. And I'm never going to undermine that fact. But then I'm like, what does that mean? Like that's we, like that's kind of that's the conflict for. And for me, I'll say this. I went I I live here. I went to Lollapalooza. Like that's that's what's going on with with me, right? Um, I got on a plane. We were there I, only for J Hope set, and so um, <laughs> it was the Mel Monkey Pox. But I was like, I'm there, and um, I didn't get it. It was all safe. It was all good. But like for me, okay. So if anyone watched the live stream or whatever, the person who performed before him uh, was the Kid Leroy. He's a white Australian. Uh, a rapper. So he performed, J-Hope performed, and the kid Leroy was, there were moments where he was like speaking in AAAV, African American vernacular English, like very much performing a version of blackness. And then J-Hope performed and what I saw was not that. And that was something that felt somewhat redemptive for me to witness like the Kid Leroy as a foil to, so none, neither of these people are black, right? But they're both rappers. Um, but like, so I do sometimes have this like desire to defend, but then it bumps up against all these other things I talked about. So I don't have an answer because they're always bumping up against each other. And I feel really weird about it all the time. <laughs> there is such a complicated set of attitudes and approaches and they're not all the same. Um, and so if we're thinking about, you know, like what might be different about J-Hope's relationship to um, hip hop and Jay Park's relationship to hip hop or black culture, um, there's no claim on the part of BTS's rappers that they are a new breed of hip hop star or they are authenticating Korean hip hop through their bodily mastery of this aesthetic. There's no attempt to like replace and exclude. Claim ownership yeah, over, yeah. Yeah, there's collaborations are, I think an effort to show solidarity as opposed to, I'm gonna do it better than you all and you, you don't need to be here. Maybe me as a fan, like accounting for growth as a way to like feel somewhat better about it. I think <laughs> it's what exists for me to be able to like move through it. Hey, another BTS stan here. <laughs> um, I, I have a question. Do you think that, you know, we were talking about how BTS became more cognizant maybe of the, the cultural appropriation. Do you see that other K-pop artists are growing in their understanding of um, paying homage to someone versus appropriating something and taking ownership of it. Do you see that other, you know, because we're Americans, we can see that so much more clearly than than maybe Koreans. Do you think that that's something that is changing within the K-pop industry? I think it's definitely changing in the fandom. I think when you see South Korean like YouTubers and people who are commenting on things, um, that conversation has changed completely. I think there are a lot more like creators and influencers who are now aware that like blackface is wrong, you know, things like that and like are not sticking up for that. That's sort of the change that I've seen. I don't know what you guys think. The change is actually quite fan driven. I give a lot of credit to fans um, who are speaking up and um, trying to make this more of a conversation within fandoms and K-pop companies, they really pay attention to what fans are talking about. And so that's kind of one salutary way that fan discourse can improve or positively impact um, industry practices. So I think that some companies got the message that they had to learn a bit more um, and that blackness is just not just a costume. But I can't say that 
I'm super confident that everybody is. It's very su- case by very case. Well, yeah, I feel educated like. about it. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. I see some hands on this side. Hi, uh, my name is Rianne. I identify as 1.5 Filipino American, and um, I'm wondering about this idea of like when we go back to our home countries, we get rejected for being American, but then there's a part of being American that's so cool and romanticized and people make money off of it. So can you help me understand why that happens? It's about power. (laughs) Korean Americans are, they have a tough time when they go back to Korea. Um, And especially if they're expecting a frictionless experience where they finally feel like they fit in somewhere, right? Um, So there can be a lot of pain to that experience, but there's also, I mean, speaking English gives you power. Yes, That's it why does. it can be um, a kind of good shield for. That's what I experienced. The feeling, yeah, of of being rejected or not totally included, and so it's about you know, like the U.S. is the global hegemon still, even though we're talking about the end of the American century or yeah. American hegemony. You know, like wealth, influence, American culture is still the dominant kind of popular culture around the world that's exported, right? So that carries a certain kind of weight. So that's so it's not just all one thing like disempowerment, it's also empowering, right? To be recognized as an, an American. Yeah, I I really do think that it's American media, like the cultural dominance that America has had for the last like few decades is like an economic and military. Yes. But like for lay people, they're not thinking about economic and military power so much as like everybody knows the big American blockbusters, but not, you know, everybody in South Korea, they'll go to the, the cinema and watch the latest like Batman movie or whatever. But it's not like mainstream Americans are going to rush to the theaters to see the latest Korean blockbuster hit. And I think that disparity is so important when it comes to like, you know, average people that even when I went, the resistance that I was met with when I was um, speaking English, right. And people would clam up and I knew, I knew what I was doing. Like I'm ashamed to admit it, that that was my defense, but I knew that they, they would almost become bashful and shrink down because they felt inferior in their inability to speak English as well, which comes from this like pretty messed up power dynamic of um, between the two countries and cultures. And, and that I think is really true. And it's, and it's sad that it worked so well for me. But we're talking about it, and that's great because I don't think that that was happening until pretty recently, you know? So, yeah, it's complicated. But, you know, the thing that I really learned through the podcast is that as Korean Americans, Filipino Americans, like we occupy a different space and it is completely valid, and we have our own history, and it's up to us to um, validate that space for ourselves and not feel inferior to or make anyone else um, feel inferior to us. Thanks for listening to this special episode of K-Pop Dreaming. Special thanks to our guests Michelle Cho and Janelle Brown. A big shout out to the LA-based Korean American organization, Kyopol, as well as Rebecca Stummy, Tony Federico, and LA's live programming and events team for putting this event together. I'm Vivian Yoon, writer and host of K-Pop Dreaming. K-Pop Dreaming is a production of LAS Studios. Fiona Ng is the senior producer and show creator. Our producers are James Chow, Minju Park, and me, Vivian Yoon, with production assistance from Taylor Kaufman. Sophia Paliza Carr is our editor. Parker McDaniels is our mix engineer. Original music by Stephen Tran. Jens Campbell and Sarah Burnett are our interns. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.
Hey, I'm Phil Yu, and you may know me from a blog called Angry Asian Man. And I'm Jeff Yang, author, journalist, and celebrity dad. We host a podcast called They Call Us Bruce, an unfiltered conversation about what's happening in Asian America. Each week or so, we host a discussion about some of the most vital and interesting topics in our pop culture and our community. Uh, we got media, entertainment, food, politics. The good, the bad, the WTF of it all. So check us out wherever you get your podcasts or at theycallsbruce.com. LAS Studios. Ma, pa, te presento a mi novia Luna. Hola, mucho gusto. Eric Galindo, co-host of Wild here, and this season I'm going to tell you a fictional love story. The type of story that feels like a movie. It was inspired by my life. The woman I was dating, off and on again for a minute, comes to me and says she wants to move to Milwaukee. You're looking at the newest anchor for YWCC News, baby! I'm going to be the face of Milwaukee's leading news source. It was a road trip adventure across America. I was steeped in love and in one of the most confusing relationships of my life. This is a Southeast LA rom-com. It's the kind of fictional audio drama that forces you to confront parts of yourself. From Alias Studios, listen to Wild Season 2, I Think I'm Falling in Love. Catch the new season on NPR One, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts.